Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is our second session talking about our digital life. So in this session, we really start to think about how deeply technology is already embedded in our life and how that trend line will continue and why it will continue uh, as we go forward. It really is important to think about how uh, we have come to depend on technology and the consequence of that as it goes deeper and deeper into our daily lives. Uh, it's, it's really important. Uh, and that was sort of how we framed up a lot of the following conversations. So this one starts with some interesting topics like about 737 MAX and, and other um, digital innovations and, and their impacts. And then it sets up all of the other sessions that are to follow. So I hope you get a lot out of this one. I'm looking forward to hearing your opinions on the Cloud 2030 uh, discussion boards in the future. The, 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 the thing that the thing that all these connect together to me in and, and, is, and the reason I rearranged the order is we are moving into a place where in 2030 and, and you know Rich is right to, to have us keep focusing on where this is going in the future with with that right that's our goal. You can easily see a time when we are so dependent on digital infrastructure in our life that we can't perform basic operations without it, right? We can't get into our house because our doors won't open. We can't start our cars because our, our you know, and security is a part of that, but it's, it's, it's a fundamental component. Um, and so, you know, extending where we, we just were, is this a problem? How do, where does it go? It, when, you know, you, you can't, you turn on the lights in your house or heat your house or grow food without our technologies. Is that, is that something that, you know, where does that go in with, for people? Someone got hit with a Google outage. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I would, I would say I, I find, I disagree. I, I think uh, the same arguments were brought up in the earliest 20th century. Um, you know, everyone, or most of the scientific community assumed that we knew all things and, um, and that all, truths had been unlocked and that existing tools solved all problems. And then lo and behold, you know, we started to realize that how little we actually knew and new tools come on, came on and um, suddenly everything changed and then everything changed again. And we've gone through this process over the last couple hundred years, many, many times where the existing tools seem uh, automate different things like the steam engine and other things. And it, you know, it disrupted all existing industries and caused people to get out of work and then new businesses started. Um, right. It happens all the time. So I and would- I'm, I'm, I'm not as worried about the, uh, about the, the change in work, Sean. I, I, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good question. I, and actually there's an access question. The next topic I think after this is, is, is access. I'm, I'm more concerned with take the 737 MAX problem. Um, where to, to tune the, the aircraft, we made it to a point where even, you know, aircrafts are only flyable by wire. They, they, they have to have a computer system that makes them stay in the air. And, and, and everything we're doing, I think if you look at solutions that we're looking at for climate change, if you're looking at, you know, electric cars and how they're, they're operating, self-driving cars, everything is getting to a point where without the technology component, without the network, actually the networked technology component, it just can't work. It'll, it'll, it'll fall down. Um, well, I would, yeah. I would push back on that a little bit. Uh, okay. So this fundamentally the 737 max problem was a problem of um, there's, a, there's a, a lack of qualified pilots in the world um, especially in many areas that don't have um, the benefit of military pilots as, as part of the supply chain for pilots. Um, they have relatively unskilled pilots flying planes. So Boeing started getting in the habit and we could get off on Boeing's um, uh, quality control of their software, but um, ignoring that for a second, they got in the habit of building planes that are somewhat automated because the quality of the pilots are incredibly poor. So they assumed that, and uh, the software was des poorly designed apparently. Um, I'm not a Sim 37 pilot, so I haven't worked, hit a simulator, but from what I've been told by people I know, there actually are pilots um, that 
they tried to assume that the pilots were of such poor quality that they had to double check that they, they knew that they were getting into a stall and that um, to actually push the wheel down so the plane wouldn't stall. Uh, well, they poorly designed it and so they caused stall. planes to crash. Um, oh. But that was fundamentally mostly a problem because of the lack of qualified human pilots. Not no, that was not the root agree. cause. The root cause was Boeing didn't want to re-architect based on new engines. And, and so new engine Boeing placement. Boeing took an existing airframe and spaghetti coated on new engines and other systems that were not appropriate. They could have made a new airplane that actually would stay in the air, but instead they went to the easy fix of software to solve the problem. And yeah, it means you have to have more experienced pilots, but it was cheaper for them to glom on new system, new subsystems and not have to go through full inspection again than to actually do it right. So it's an architecture problem. They didn't re-architect when re-architecture was necessary. And to your earlier point, Rocky, it was the it is actually it is bunging on a solution after the fact as opposed to going back to fundamentals. And that is absolutely the the, the 737 max issue. And that goes um, back to Lawrence's issue in that companies are not currently designed to consider re-architecture. Re-architecture is time consuming. And, and costly. So you're gonna go with the fast fix, even if it seem, if even if it costs a little more because to them it's cheaper than the time spent on the re-architecture. Well, it's usually kicking the can down the street. It's technical, yeah. it's, it's incurring technical debt to, to solve a problem immediately as opposed to um, kind of thinking about the long-term consequence but, but, but and I, I and know. and the cost of the cost of re-architecting is is significant so once again what are you protecting what is what is at risk and what what is the you know what is the value of protection to you I, but to me if you extrapolate that line forward part of what we're able to do with software and AI and ML is tuning, tuning systems into such a degree of efficiency that they do not operate without that, that component in them. Yeah. Right. Um, and we so don't, I, we don't, op we don't operate a society without electricity. Now, we're, do we, do we, we need new we, ways of distributing it? Well, and, and, but we're going to move, say, to wind and solar panel, and we're going to decommission. You know, power plants today just generate tons of extra energy. Yeah. And we just count on the systems, absorb it. Like we have enough, like and everything we have has huge amounts of reserve capacity in it because we don't, we don't, but we don't tune it. We don't, we haven't had to tune it. We're moving to a point that I can see really clearly where we can embed software into things, run it to a, an, an edge where it breaks you know, where, where it would break without the software. Yes. Um, so I think there's a, there's a challenge with that though, Rob, which is theoretically, I agree with you. In reality, and as we go between over the next 10 years, I'm not sure that that hits into reality. And the reason I say that is that you have to have trust in data and trust in operations to be able to do it. And as you get to especially larger organizations, like I'll go back to just past experiences. There were many, many opportunities where I could put automation in place, but the problem was the trust wasn't there in the systems and the companies that were building that automation. And if things went sideways, it wasn't that company that felt the heat. It was me that felt the heat because it was my responsibility to ensure the safe operations of our infrastructure and systems and applications. And so unless the trust is going to be there around automation, I think it's gonna be really hard to, to be able to move that forward. Now we're starting to see that from the bottom up, we're starting to see automation start to creep in from the bottom rungs of infrastructure and start to move up, right? But I'm, I'm a little hesitant as to how far up it will go over the next 10 year horizon. 
And, and trust is, is the problem, not just from a personal level where yes. people just don't trust technology, but also from a legal problem. Like what when things go wrong, uh, right now, you, the legal system can point to a person saying like, it's your fault. It might not be their fault. It might be them blamed by someone else, but there is someone that can point to that. When an automated system breaks, who gets to blame? Is it the yeah. manufacturer? Is it the person who supplied the data to train it? Is it the operator? And this is, Klaus, you're absolutely right. And this is where I, I can't tell you how many times I've had people say, well, fine, then let's, you know, legal teams, my legal team coming to me and saying, then we need to put the liability clause in the contract with said provider, where if we endure some level of financial impact in a negative way that our provider must was reimburse us essentially for it for for lack of a, a longer explanation um and that's just not good business for them they they just can't they won't do it and they can't go there so i think the i think the the boeing 737 max provides us an example about how society is going to treat those kinds of automated failures it's really clear boeing was at fault um the manufacturer the the creator of that technology was held up and vilified um, both uh, both in the courts and uh, and in their own settlement practices and certainly and certainly by the press right the pilots weren't vilified right the airlines weren't vilified um, it was the manufacturer that was yeah but the, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, keep going. Derek. I will say um, I, I have some background in in aerospace, and I will say that Boeing was in a lot of ways negligent in that particular situation because of the corners that they cut. But that still doesn't answer the question. Even if nobody is downright negligent, mistakes happen, and who's to blame then? It's you know, to, to kind of address Rob's anxiety about, you know, are we building systems, uh, whether for reasons of just efficiency, are we building systems that are becoming too complicated where you have to trust technology? Um, I am, I'm okay with kind of sort of that as long as we go into it eyes wide open, right? Um, as long as we are able to before we start implementation on an architecture, and I completely get it there, nobody wants to go back and re-architect because the cost of doing that is really, really high. And yes, um, the, the catch is, are we eyes wide open going in and marking it out and saying, yes, we recognize that there is a risk to uh, not just you know having to address technical debt, but we're actually building new technical debt. That happens, but you have to put markers. If you're working at a large solution provider or a large company, uh, this happened when we started using, you know, let's rather than hand waving or, you know, looking at aviation examples or uh, analogies, false analogies, I should say, with the healthcare system, because in security, there are no perverse incentives, right? Nobody that is doing either security research or building security products is saying, yeah, I'm going to purposely leave these gaps so I can, you know, make sure other guys can come in and my own security consultant can come in and fix up the patches that I'm leaving. So, uh, you know, there are honest brokers that are in the security research space that are in security provider space. Um, so let's take those analogies apart. Uh, let's use, you know, examples that are relevant that all of us understand in the industry. Uh, serverless started a while back, function started a while back. Uh, when we started using them, we knew exactly what we were gaining and what we were losing. Um, and now there are security companies the last two, three years that are you know, trying to fill that gap. But those who adopted serverless and function compute, for instance, you know, use a very tangible example if they were marking out and they were saying that, yes, we are using this, but the premises, these are ephemeral workloads, the state isn't preserved in any of the microservices, it's okay, you know, it's, there's less of a security risk, but you could also say that, you know, you have to have some observability to take a look at, say, a token ID from the API gateway, to be able to correlate it all the way down to the S3 bucket, 
there was a big gap, right? But if you were able to address it and say, this is what we are gaining, we're gaining massive efficiency, we're adopting serverless compute, but we are losing on observability. So new solutions come up, right? So it's not that you can predict and say, are we just not using the existing tool set? Well, uh, that's again, right? That's this, this a false dichotomy. Many cases you have to come and adopt new ways of software consumption of entirely new compute paradigms, um, but say that this is what we foresee as a risk, right? So new solutions, whether that's a sidecar on every container or whether that's observability stacks that you build in the functions, um, go into it eyes wide open or, you know, say that there are, you know, maybe I'm not accounting for 10% of the unknown unknowns. Um, rather than just saying, well, we are not going to do this because you are gaining massive on the efficiency side, right? Uh, there think, will um, always be, you will always keep building technical debt, but be somewhat judicious about it. You know, again, this is a risk mitigation approach. Um, just think about what you're building and mark out and clarify, hey, we are going to start investing in this tech stack these are the risks or these are the unknown risks. Um, you can't just stop a company from saying, no, we're, we're going to stick with what we know because these are the tool sets we know, right? We're going to stick with a hammer. We're not going to use robotics. And that, that I think actually leads to one thing, Ajit, that you, you hit on, and that is observability and making sure that when you're building these new systems and new infrastructure, you build in observability from, or at least if not observability, let's say recording, it's the logging, it's the, it's the you know, keeping track of what has happened. And then on a security basis, making sure that that log, making sure that that videotape is in fact um, authentic. It is not, uh, it, it hasn't been tampered with. You haven't uh, allowed somebody to sneakily get in through the, through the supply chain. But observability and, and monitoring is really one of those things that you do in order to, con to protect yourself from the unknowns coming down the pike. Yeah, and, but you know, when, when you and start to, to And to Rob's point, using software to tune and to, you know, deal with those things that are less malleable, less changeable. And, and in, in particular with observability and monitoring and logging, et cetera, you have to, rather than just say, hey, we bought in a security SI consultant or a compliance guy that did a check mark, yes, we have say Splunk in place. Um, you have to understand a very holistic view of where the compute model is changing. I saw companies and I went in and I, you know, completely, you know, it was a facepalm moment when they go, yes, we have monitoring and security in place, but their monitoring, logging, monitoring, uh, log retention policies, they were all very specific to, a, you know, a system of record approach, right? It, it still said, okay, this is, I have a holistic logging of, containers that are running on this OS, that's it, right? There wasn't a full stretch of a thread of what the application workflow would look like. So you could say, yeah, I have monitoring logging in place, but now I'm on serverless. Well, yeah, the same monitoring logging in place, log retention policies in place don't work with functions. So you could just do a you know very naive checkbox tick and say, oh, yeah, it's there. They, they no, do if there. you're AWS and you're running the, you're running the underpinnings. Right. And, you know, even though AWS came up with serverless and Lambda, uh, they were lagging, right, on, on the security observability controls. And that's what I mean, that it's not that they're stupid. It's the Pareto principle. They are, they are going out, but folks who really understand it, right, well, they could new, say that there is a gap there that we need to fill this gap. The new architectures, you have, you have changed responsibility. I mean, my, you are, my, you are, my, you're delegating responsibility to someone else for something that you used to take responsibility for. So, so we have a topic coming problem. up about about the SAS yeah. of things like that, which is which is where we're going to move into real black box stuff. I guess. I mean, I guess maybe this 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 question is as simple as a yes or no, and and everybody's just nodding, and I'm I'm 
uh, framing it right. If in five years and definitely in 10 years, right, I can't see any system that I use on a daily basis not being interconnected to a network in a way that that makes that that is optional that it will continue to function if it is not connected to a network for uh forever for a for a particular length of time rob um i think we're going to have to figure out how to make systems resilient so that it's it's there's a length of time, but yeah, I, I would assume that if I have a system that goes off the grid for more than an hour, it's going to, it's going to fail. Okay. Um, and I think 5G is, is, you know, as much as I don't believe the hype, 10 years from now, I think that the idea that I can build a system that is connected to everything else and depends on that for its brains, um, will actually maybe, maybe let me, let me do a 2030 scenario and see if that this, pulls the conversation into the into the place where I was envisioning. But right right now we make it's expensive, but we do this. We make things very smart. We have to, right? Cars have to be smart, our phones have to be smart, our utilities, all that stuff has to be smart. But when you have ubiquitous networking, it does not make sense to put any processing power or any extra processing power into any device. Right. It makes mm. sense to move all oh, of the software right, and all right. of the all of that into the into the network or across the network. When you say it doesn't make sense, what kind of sense are we talking about? Economic sense? You're talking about because I I disagree I, with that it, premise. It's, that statement. Well, you've got more expensive processors. You've, now, assuming there isn't some major change in processors, but I could put cheaper processors. I could have easier software. I could provide more security. I could reduce my battery load, right? So if, if I'm selling you um, an, an augmented reality headset Doesn't and I can make that of... thing have almost no processor, but just run the video back yeah. to my local cloud, then my augmented reality headset just has to be the cost <laughs> of the sensors and the displays. Yes. Uh, and so can, just, I, uh, can I bring one <laughs> example why that's not correct? Um, Lawrence is about to start punching the screen. Contrarian. <laughs> Give you a great example why it is. It's correct, really so. short, I, I promise you. Um, so there are um, small form factor systems out there now that have uh, a small amount of AI built into them and they're, they're built as such. And there's actually projects around these. Um, oh. If that wasn't the case, then Rob would be exactly correct. But the fact, I, I think it's somewhat, I understand the premise of what you're thinking about, Rob. If all networks were always able to move all data at all times and your premise is correct, but that's, that's never gonna be true. There's always gonna be more data than there is network. So we have to, uh, right now, there's more and more compute that's going more and more to the edge, closer to where the data originates from. And we're gonna see more and more edge computing. We're already seeing that in 5G networks and um, all the caching that makes the internet work right now, that didn't exist 20 years ago. And it's because there's so much more data than there is network. And that's never, never, ever going, a problem that's never going, ever going to be solved. So, yeah. um, and right now, because um, compute has gotten so cheap and memory has gotten so cheap and storage has gotten so cheap that we can move more and more intelligence closer to where the, dead, the data comes from, which to a certain extent, very soon will be our houses, our phones, yeah. Um, the and, and that launch pad, wherever it happens to be, or the satellite. So go that ahead. I'll, I'll to, that speaks to Rob's problem of of um, can this survive in, in an outage, in a disconnected mode when there's a power outage, when there's a fire, when what have you. So I completely agree. This is this is in fact the the impetus. This is the this is the move towards a lot of edge computing or distributed computing or community computing. And that is what is actually driving it. Yeah, so to just reinforce this, again, if, we're, if the focus is on 2030, I think for the most part, I, I agree with Rob's assessment if we're talking about 2021 20, to maybe 2025, but as we think about 2030, I'm on my new Mac M1, 
re has replaced my 16 inch mm -hmm. MacBook Pro with i9 processor, I don't notice the difference. The amount of power that it uses, the, uh, the amount of uh, power that it uses kind of uh, solidifies A16Z's assumption that the cost of processing will get closer to zero than the increase in actual performance. So if we think about what types of devices we can put at the edge, where we're actually putting uh, ARM CPUs of today into hard drives of the future, we the I kind of push back on the data will outpace our ability to process it. I think we'll catch up to that. Computational computing is a real thing. So in 2030, as we think about computational computing, distributed, distributed control plane, uh, VMware's crazy idea with pushing the hypervisor services and storage services further out to the edge, that capability will be there on at the edge from a compute capacity perspective. The question will be, will the control plane be there to coordinate all of it? I'm not as convinced that the control plane part of it will catch up to it. I think folks like Rob and, and, and Mark can speak to this more intelligently, but that's a really hard problem that we have not figured out. And the control plane also means in those cases where there is disconnection, the ability to maintain or or continue to operate perhaps in a degraded mode, but not fail completely while waiting for re-interconnection. So uh, Rich, again, you know, I'm, I'm gonna add some very tangible examples of things that we should know if we're in the industry, right? The recent long AWS outage with, well, started off with Kafka, but there were a lot of other services that they had built on top. So a very tangible example that we can use are the iRobot Roombas, right? Um, during that outage, they were working, right? They're not mission critical. They're just cleaning up your houses. Uh, they were working, but they were in a degraded state while the Kafka outage was going on. Um, so, you know, what are other scenarios that we can think of? That is a case where you can't say, well, you know, is this compute in the core? Is this compute at the edge? Uh, it's tiered storage and it's tiered compute. There is amount of storage and compute that's going on on the device itself, on your local iRobot Roomba, et cetera. And there is lots of other compute that happens in the core. It is when a partition happens, when in, in this case, let's, you know, when a network partition happens um, or when there is a service that goes out, Kafka itself goes out internally within a particular region. Um, what, what, how does the device itself function, right? I mean, if this was an automated, fully connected glucometer that is dispensing insulin um, in a degraded state, yep, maybe I don't want those life critical decisions to depend upon the core when there is a network partition, right? Um, you design systems that way. Now, I'm not saying that if you start building systems that way, there aren't any gaps that you won't fall into. It's just having a good appreciation, what do I, always scratching your head, what do I not know? What are other scenarios and what are ways in which systems can fail? What are ways in which different APIs can fail? Um, to really talk real quick about two different points, it, yes, there's a lot of compute that's happening on the edge, but there is a backward push to address, you know, Rob's a viewpoint as well, that, you know, if we have better controls can we do them in the cloud? So there are certain workloads that are coming off of end devices and moving into the cloud as well. There's a backward push as well. So what used to be purely, purely client-side compute, JavaScript compute, um, they, they are companies, CDN players, that are saying, we can take this off your desktop, you know, let's run this on, they will call it the edge, but it's, you know, moving radially into the core. So they're taking it off the desktop, whether that's rendering, uh, they're moving that close, the entire Jamstack that's running on Cloudflare right now, um, that is essentially taking what you would normally do, you know, essentially a thick client, they're running a thick client at the edge. Um, your, uh, augmented reality headsets that Sean and Rob both touched on, 
there again, right, it's not just, you know, can you be a disconnected headset entirely? No, the, the use cases there are what needs to happen truly, truly at the edge. Now, this is data that is, that is a half-life. It's telemetry data. It's environmental data that is only relevant at the edge. There, that's fine. You know, run that on the local, local headset compute. But things that you can allow for maybe 10 plus millisecond in terms of response time, that should perhaps be at a local zone. Um, and then there are other storage and compute that can actually genuinely happen at the core. Well, so that that's speaks to I, planning I, I'm, I'm, and it's also planning for moving the, the locus of compute or the locus of storage and being being prepared for that to you know in advance uh, if I can if I can de detect an outage and take up the the role of um, some you know some piece of JavaScript and run it in my local browser instead of on the cloud great wonderful for a, a short period of time I can continue to be functioning operable for some degree of operation. I, 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 I think we're, I think we may have kind of come to the end of this one though, but yeah. Well, no, but you're, you're absolutely right. You know, this idea of running browser on the client versus taking over what CDNs are now saying, right? We can take over the browser security as well, essentially run a headless browser on the edge. Yes. Sure. That's, so, it's that's so, essentially running a thick so, client, running a browser. Yeah, but but on so let, this is actually a good transition point for I'm I'm switching the topics around in the back in the background because where we are is really right at the edge of one of the topics that was very activating throughout our conversations, which is the subscription model for technology development, right? The sassification of every uh, and of 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 our delivery mechanisms for technology. And, and what, we're, what we're talking about with some of this is, you know, the increasing move of certain core pieces of the infrastructure into a, you know, rental model um, for how these things go. And so that's fundamentally an economics. This is, and this is what I would bring in with this is the, is the economics question for, for where this goes. I hope this was interesting. It's undeniable that technology is such an instrumental part of everything we're doing. And that trend is only gonna continue as we become more and more dependent on digital infrastructure as part of our daily existence. And yet the way we're doing that is really tied into the economics of subscription. It's not just about owning infrastructure, it's actually about renting and, and, and subscribing to things. Uh, we've really turned a lot of the traditional capital models on their heads in, in cloud, and that trend will accelerate. That is the next topic of our next session. Enjoy it.